Hi. Um, hi. <laughs> so first, uh, thank you for joining and welcome to this talk. And uh, let me briefly introduce myself. My name is Ivan Vagulin. I'm a senior software architect at Tieto Every and an independent security researcher. I don't have a fancy career in InfoSec, not much discussion here, definitely not a hacker. So I am a member of HealthSec group. group, and that's probably as close as I can get to being a hacker. Uh, well, maybe a few times in my life, I considered that maybe InfoSec should be my become my professional career. And that what should I be doing for my day job, but it did not quite worked out for me. So then I decided that I'm good where I am now. Well, anyways, uh, I own some pages and some CVs, if that is supposed to mean anything. And you can follow me on Twitter at this handle, Eva Gunin. OK, so let's get to actual talk. So uh, today I'm going to tell you a story, a story about five CVs that I got discovered in SharePoint. And uh, this was almost a year long story. It started in 2019. And uh, to understand, to follow the story, you actually won't need any knowledge of prior knowledge of SharePoint because it's not that specific to SharePoint, but uh, it would be good if you have some experience in developing ASP.NET web applications because we are going to look at some code and go through that and see how that code is working, how it's failing. Uh, well, uh, as I mentioned, this story started in early 2019. And uh, at that time, I was already doing some researches for SharePoint and finding bugs in it. Uh, but for me, the story started with, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, the story started with CV discovered by another developer uh, or researcher and uh, We'll get back to that in a minute. But first, uh, before we go to the actual story, let me introduce you some facts about SharePoint because I assume that most of you are not that familiar with SharePoint. As for me, I was working with Microsoft Office products for more than 10 years, and some of those years were exclusively working with SharePoint. It was a kind of hard times. So. Uh, but uh, here are a few facts that uh, will be important for this discussion. Uh, first, uh, SharePoint, uh, I bet you have, you have heard its name, but uh, if you are not really familiar with that, it's a huge platform by uh, Microsoft, and uh, it's kind of not a single product. It's a kind of family of products, uh, different kind of products like a collabor collaboration platform, uh, enterprise search, business automation and uh, many different things I need. But for this discussion, we will consider that SharePoint is just a simple ASP.NET web application. And uh, the web application, just like a normal one, it has a database where it persists its data and it has some web interface that remote users can access. And that will be enough of SharePoint understanding for this discussion. Uh, then uh, another thing to understand about SharePoint that uh, as a platform, as a service, it developed for more than 15 years. And uh, uh, while it was evolving, it transitioned from a fully featured development platform to multi-tenant uh, software as a service solution, which is uh, SharePoint Online. And it's uh, probably the most popular product in SharePoint family nowadays. And uh, that brings us to third point, is that every remote code execution is now critical in SharePoint. Because uh, I was asked like a few times in my research, like, uh, is this really critical if it can be exploited only with a higher privilege in SharePoint? Is it critical if you need to be authenticated to exploit this RC in SharePoint? And the answer is yes, for reasons that if you manage to execute code in SharePoint server in the context of web application account, you will be able to pass tenant partition in SharePoint online. And uh, for, so uh, like uh, attack would be like, you can register tenant in SharePoint online, you can do whatever misconfiguration of your tenant, and then you can launch 
remote code execution against your tenant and you can get data from other tenants. So every RC in SharePoint is now attributed as critical by Microsoft Security Response Center. So that free fact is almost all you should know about SharePoint before starting. And uh, we will touch some other details later. Okay. So uh, this story uh, started for me with uh, CV 2019-0604, uh, which was discovered by another researcher. And uh, it was this, uh, published in early 2019. And this CV exploits uh, .NET deserialization of untrusted uh, types controlled by user. And uh, it became really popular soon after it was published because it was used in Kharkov Middle East government in uh, April, if I remember correct, and then late, late in July it was used for United Nations hack, and uh, there were much talking about that, and there is a lot of information online that you can find about this CV. Uh, so when it got to my attention, the CV, I of course uh, reversed the, the security fix for the CV and found what, what it was about, and like reversing SharePoint is not that because most of SharePoint is written in .NET, so like not a hacker like me could reverse it. Uh, so at that point, I was maybe a bit jealous because this CV is a it's RC, which is really easy to exploit in SharePoint, and you don't need uh, any kind of tricky configuration to make uh, before you can actually exploit it. And uh, uh, I did discover RCs in SharePoint before, but my my attacks were really kind of sophisticated, not very likely to be executed by anyone. So I wanted to find something similar to that CV, some remote code execution, which will be probably exploited with a low privilege in SharePoint. And uh, just for information, all CV, all RCs that were discovered in SharePoint, they are authenticated RCs. Uh, I'm not aware of any authenticated RC to date. So my target was some authenticated RC, but with low privileges. So uh, I started searching and uh, I usually do start my research with some static analysis of code of SharePoint, which is, as I mentioned, easily reversible because it's .NET. And uh, I did some searching around and I found this piece of code. Uh, uh, it's not not exact one, but it's kind of my pseudo code. But it's uh, it looks like uh, this similar. So uh, if you are familiar with ASP.NET programming, you can probably understand. If not, I will briefly explain. So here you can see a method which is attributed as web method. It means that it can be executed by remote user just by sending HTTP request. And uh, inside this method, we can see a call to something called parse control. Uh, where the user input, uh, input from web request is fed right into this method, and this method creates some instance of some class, which is an ASP.NET control. So for me, it was really like exciting uh, because that was exactly what I was looking for. Uh, it was a method which I could call remotely. It uh, does require, it does some access checking, but it's probably okay. Uh, and uh, it, uh, execute some parsing code on a string, which is parsed from, uh, passed from HTTP request, and it creates an object of it. So probably I could exploit it to get an RC. Nice and simple. But then I always need to take a second glance because of the first glance when I get excited, I usually just don't see something. And uh, this was the case. I double checked and I found that uh, prior this calls to parse control method, uh, there is actually a check which is called for, uh, which is called check safe control something. Input is not exactly name, but it's kind of descriptive names that I give it. And uh, apparently failing this check will stop execution of method and we cannot get our payload to parse control. Okay, yes, and this is the point where I get much less excited about this issue. And I'm thinking that probably I should just give it away and continue my search. And let's uh, quickly check uh, what that check for safe control means. Uh, 
since the beginning in SharePoint, uh, there was this idea of trusted and untrusted pages. Uh, since SharePoint is uh, also kind of web content publishing controls, uh, sorry, uh, web uh, content publishing platform, uh, pages in SharePoint can be created by normal remote users. And when page is created by a remote user, uh, by HTTP API, so HTTP web calls, those pages are considered to be untrusted. And uh, those pages, uh, they look like a normal ASPX page, but actually they are not. Uh, they are not a real file, some file system of SharePoint server. They are just a kind of virtual file that resides in SharePoint database. And of course, for those pages, there are a lot of restrictions. Uh, what kind of ASP.NET controls you can put on them? Uh, those kind of pages they cannot execute in line ASP.NET code blocks, and uh, compilation is uh, kind of forbidden for those pages. On the other hand, uh, we have a notion of a trusted page, and trusted page it cannot be created by a remote user. It's a mechanism of extensibility of SharePoint. It can only be created by SharePoint developers, and those pages are real files that are mapped uh, to SharePoint web application via a special virtual di directory, for example, underscore layouts. That's a special name. Please remember it will need it for the next slide. Just for one slide, you can remember it. And those pages, they don't have any kind of restrictions. Uh, all what is allowed in normal ASP.NET pages is allowed on that SharePoint pages, on trusted SharePoint pages as well. So those pages can contain any code, any web controls, and uh, all kind of stuff. So basically, if you could somehow get your page to that uh, to physical to SharePoint server, you could also obviously execute uh, some code, but uh, the idea is that you cannot. OK, so how does SharePoint actually knows that uh, if current page that it parses as a response to user request, is it a trusted page or is it not trusted page? In ASP.NET, uh, there is a special mechanism for that called page parser filter. And this is just a special .NET class that you inherit in your code. And inside that class, you implement a custom logic. And SharePoint uses this mechanism uh, and a filter called SP page parcel, parcel filter. And uh, inside that class, it actually checks uh, like uh, is um, uh, it checks the vir virtual path of current page. And if this page appears to be untrusted, for example, if it's mapped again uh, uh, on a root virtual virtual directory of a web applications, and this page is untrusted and compilation is not allowed, and the uh, unsafe ASP.NET controls are not allowed on this page. So, and this kind of mechanism, it's, uh, well, at least I could not find any idea how I could bypass it, because it's a standard ASP.NET mechanism for dealing with this kind of situation. So in that case, uh, if a page, uh, if request is untrusted, there is no way you can execute a remote code in it. So, at that point, uh, I was kind of ready to give up that entry point and continue my search for somewhere. Um, in this case, the develop, uh, developer creates a new page object and it assigns a virtual path uh, to make it look like, like a real page. And the thing about this virtual path is that it's mapped under a root directory. So in this case, call to parse control, it should be in a context of untrusted page. And if it is in a context of untrusted page, actually this check, it should not be needed because uh, there is a separate check for safe controls inside page uh, uh, filter, uh, partial filter. So I started thinking that maybe, of course, it was put there just by accident, like developers put something and forgot, but maybe it served some, really served some purpose in here. So I decided to dig a bit further and uh, go and check what, what is the sparse control method, what it really does. So starting by browsing MSDN, I found that there are two versions of uh, parse control method. 
And first, we'll take a string and parse it into contact object, that the one we are using. And the second one, it takes a string and it takes, takes a second parameter, which is Boolean. And I found it a bit interesting. And if we check this method, and if we check the name of second parameter, uh, yeah, thank you for like descriptive names. Uh, this, uh, if this uh, parameter is true, then uh, parse control method, it will be ignoring the parser filter, all the restrictive things which are set in that parser filter class. And in this case, we will be able to bypass all the uh, restrictions that we have in SharePoint. But the problem is that uh, I would usually expect that uh, the first version of this method, which have only one string parameter, uh, it will default this second parameter to true because it would be a secure version of that. But I still kind of was not ready to give up on this target and uh, probably got a bit too invested in that. So I went and I decompiled this method in .NET libraries. And luckily, what I see is that the first implementation with only one parameter, it actually defaults this uh, ignore partial uh, filter parameter to true. So this is kind of unsafe version of this uh, method call. And uh, till this day, I'm not sure why it's implemented like that, why it will have unsafe default. Uh, it's maybe because uh, the second version was uh, added later with that second parameter and then did not want to change uh, behavior of method which was already in use with one parameter. But it's kind of, well, super unclear why they did it like that. So uh, once again, I get excited that I can get my remote code executed in the context of that method. So I start feeding different kind of input to that method with a server side code blocks uh, with unsafe ISP.NET controls. But for some reason, code compilation doesn't happen and my code does not execute. Well, I'm banging my head a bit and uh, I have to continue reading MSDN and I find this remark. And it says that this uh, method, the parse control method, it never causes the compilation. Which is of course a bit upsetting because I was hoping to get some like an easy RC, but it probably wasn't going to happen. Well, still I was not ready to give up yet. So I started thinking that um, uh, besides uh, feeding different kind of inputs with different kind of ASP.NET uh, controls in this method, I might try something else. And something else in this case uh, will, will be that uh, ASP.NET, it supports a uh, few type of text, uh, obviously uh, web controls itself, uh, server side scripts, and uh, one tag would be uh, ASP.NET directive. And uh, from my like, uh, fr from things I already found out about parse control, uh, because I already did some debugging of it and stepping through its code, I kind of knew that it does parse the ISP.NET directives. So I decided to go and check uh, what kind of directives could I use to cause code compilation and code execution. And uh, I browse for a full list of directives in MSDN. There are quite a few of them, but of course. I took the most obvious one, uh, which can cause the compilation. It's uh, at assembly directive. And if we take a look at MSDN page for that directive, bingo, we will see that this directive have like a kind of two sets of attributes. Uh, one would be name of assembly, the fully qualified assembly name. And another would be a source attribute, which can be a path to the source file. And uh, well, I don't know, I've been developing like uh, .NET applications for like 10 years and I didn't know that this kind of thing exists in ASP.NET. But that's pretty neat because uh, I fitted uh, this playload to the parse control method and uh, I got an error, but uh, luckily the error says that it cannot locate this file on server. So actually it did try to locate the source file and compile it. So, uh, I, this is how I got my code compiled and I verified that my code is getting uh, compiled from the source I can put to SharePoint. 
and uh, from there it gets uh, loaded to SharePoint application domain, but uh, still it was only compilation. I would need to have some method to run the code that I compiled. Uh, well, my first thought that was that in .NET, there must be some mechanism to execute code on event of loading application to up domain. And uh, it uh, seemed to be re really the case. There is something called uh, .NET module initializers. And uh, it's uh, special like uh, syntax in intermediate language that you can use to specify some code which will be executed uh, on uh, when your assembly is loaded to up domain. But unfortunately, this feature seems uh, not to be available in C Sharp yet. And uh, there is this uh, discussion on GitHub if, if it should be available or not. So go and upload it because we want to have some ECRCs, not the hard ones. Uh, and in ISP.NET, we have only C Sharp and Visual Basic available for compilations because those are two are default compilers and it's uh, applied same to SharePoint. It have only C Sharp and Visual Basic. I found some information that uh, model initializers, they might be exposed in Visual Basic. I am not a big Visual Basic guy. I tried it for a few days and uh, then I just gave up. I didn't find any way to uh, reproduce the model initializer using Visual Basic. So, but if you know one, let me know how this can be done. I tried uh, other things that could execute code on a uh, type loading, like uh, type initializers and static constructors, but uh, unfortunately not. So all I could do is just compile my code and get it to SharePoint up domain, but not execute it. Uh, at least not like an easy way to execute, or I didn't find one maybe. Uh, but then I started thinking a bit differently uh, because parse control, it not only it, it not only processes the markup itself, it also creates an instance of an object, of a control object uh, from markups that you feed into this method. And uh, I was trying to get something out of it, uh, some ISP.NET feature, which could help me to execute some code when control is created. And luckily I found one feature, it's called a control builder. There might be another ones, I don't know. But a control build builder used like that, so you create your custom type inherited from one of the standard control builders. And then in constructor, you put whatever code you want. We can put our playload in here. And then you decorate your custom class of your custom control with this uh, attribute name. And we'll see the demo how this uh, CV works in action. So, ooh, that's Discord. So uh, here I have my SharePoint farm, uh, which is unpatched since like um, maybe never. I don't know. It's a part of farm that I use for test. It's not production, no worse than that. So first thing I would need to do, I would, uh, I have my playload in here, which uh, looks exactly as I show you on the slide. I would first need to upload this playload to SharePoint and that will require me to have at least uh, write permissions to SharePoint, so it's uh, a bit bigger than the other CV that I wanted to knock, but well, it's okay. Yeah. yeah, we just connect and we upload this file. We can put it in uh, any folder in here. So our file is now in SharePoint. Let's quickly check. It was site pages, playload. Uh, I'll try. Uh, do I have zoom here? No. Second. And no. I'll make it this one. Yes. So uh, now uh, we would need to prepare the, the playload. And it's also exactly the same, same playload I showed you on slide. Uh, we will feed, try to fit the string to our 
vulnerable parse uh, control method. And for that, I made a script, uh, which just, it uh, kind of takes this playload uh, and it encodes it in XML and then sends a SOAP request with this playload embedded inside. Let's see how it works. Uh, I will have to zoom it out again. Wait, can. Is not. Yes, thank you. And uh, to show you what's happening when you execute this uh, request to SharePoint, and uh, we should keep an eye on these two processes because it's a SharePoint application pool. I'm not sure which one is that application that we are now targeting. Yeah, but here you can see that first uh, we have a C-sharp compiler executed in the context of uh, SharePoint uh, web application pool process in here. And uh, we obviously have our playload parsed and executed as well. And it's executed under SharePoint application pool account. It means that uh, exploiting this bug in SharePoint online would mean that uh, we could bypass it and partitioning and get data of other tenants escalating horizontally in there all the way. All right. So that's the whole demo. <laughs> Let's stop it now. Yep, and let's get back to slide uh, one while I still have connection. Yeah, yeah. so I reported uh, this issue in July uh, to Microsoft Secure Response Center, and uh, as usually they can confirm it quite fast. Uh, maybe it takes a uh, couple of weeks for them to confirm. Uh, but, uh, and then they uh, pay bounty if uh, bounty is valid for the submission. But then like for a few months, I hear nothing of them. And obviously I am waiting for a fix for this issue. And uh, there is no any news coming and it's already autumn. And I want to go and tell someone about this thing with parse control. But obviously I cannot because, well, it's, it's well, just probably not good uh, until it's uh, already fixed. Uh, and then I decided uh, that maybe I should go and check like what other places in SharePoint are references, uh, referencing this method, this uh, parse control thing. And uh, it's funny how this simple idea did not came to me in the first place when I was reporting the first issue. But nevertheless, I did uh, this kind of code scan of SharePoint and checked that there are few references uh, to parse control in other places. Uh, where user input is fitted into the parse control. And those uh, places can be probably reached by uh, executing some web request to SharePoint. But uh, those places were a bit different in a sense that uh, they were protected by some additional checks, uh, by some input sanitization and all those things. Uh, but at least uh, for references that I have discovered, they also used um, uh, to call this parse control method, uh, ignoring the parse filter uh, with this uh, parameter set to true, or actually without setting this parameter explicitly to false, which would be a safe and call in that way. All right, so let's see uh, how those plate, uh, places and code were exposed, uh, sorry, exploited. So first, uh, I got uh, two places where I could inject my playload uh, but it looked a bit differently. The injection was not that simple as uh, in the example I showed you, the first one, where the whole user input was fitted into parse control. In this case, um, the injected uh, input, uh, which came from user control parameters in a web part, uh, it was uh, inserted in the middle of the string, and then this whole formatted string was fitted to parse control. It's also didn't look exactly like that, but that's the idea that you could only inject into middle of the string. And in this case, if you find a place like that where you could inject in the middle of some ISP.NET control, uh, you cannot use a directives to uh, cause a code compilation or execution because the ISP.NET directives are supposed to come first before any other control de declarations. So this seems like it will be a hard to 
exploit at first, but uh, actually there is a way, uh, there is another way that we did not discuss yet, another mechanism to call, uh, to execute code in ASP.NET, just controlling some smaller part of markup like this string in this example. And uh, this is uh, what is called unsafe controls in ASP.NET. And uh, if you are not familiar with uh, this term, uh, the unsafe control means that uh, this control could harm your site somehow uh, just by uh, manipulating its properties. So you don't have access to code, but you just have access to control markup it, it, itself. You can fit different markups to ASP.NET parser and that could cause uh, code execution or some other harmful actions. So for a code execution, you can use is object data source control, which is a standard ASP.NET control. And uh, because uh, what this control does, it can execute like any method that you can specify as a property of this control on, on types that you can specify. So for example, you can specify obviously to execute some process and uh, just to call a start method of a system diagnostic of process type, right? Uh, so in this case, uh, we can inject our maliciously formed ASP.NET control, for example, object data source uh, to the middle of the string and it will perfectly work. Uh, also in that case, injection was a bit hard because uh, you have to inject uh, uh, this parameter value, it comes from a web part properties and the web part in SharePoint and ISP.NET is a special kind of uh, server-side web control. This uh, markup that we injected, it is uh, fetched from uh, share, uh, web part properties, which is an XML file. And for that XML file, uh, there is additional check that there is nothing malicious in this uh, property. But the thing they did not consider is that uh, to get this property, they using the XML parser. So they parse out this value and then they apply these checks on the top of what they parsed in. So what we can do to bypass, we can just simply inject here embedded XML command. So uh, when XML parsing is parsing this code, it will think that all inside this value is just a command and it will ignore it. But when, ASP when this value is fitted to ASP.NET parser, it will use a different mechanism. It does not use XML parsing because ASP.NET markup is not XML, uh, at least not a well-formed XML. Uh, ASP.NET will use a regular expression and it will use uh, this uh, XML command just as a text, as a simple text in HTML. So uh, this one way you can bypass if you face in a situation where uh, your control is validated by uh, just uh, XML parsing, and that is obviously not the right thing to do. You should not validate ASP.NET markup using just an XML parse. Right, uh, and for that I got uh, two CVs, uh, 920 and 929. I think I'm not exactly aware of numbers, but I, I think that was it. Uh, because I got uh, four of them in bunch, so I don't know which one relates to each uh, vulnerability, and I also reported those four also at once. But another type of injection I faced is when a uh, uh, string to parse control, it was, uh, it was made as a result of XSL transformation. Uh, it, it was a result of some XML uh, transformation using some XSL templates that user could control the XSL template itself. And in this case, what you need to do, you just have to create an XSL template that produces the result you want. And in our case, we will want to make just same two directives that we will be using the assembly and the control directive. And it's just a matter of uh, creating a proper template, so like omitting the declarations because uh, ISP.NET di uh, directives, they should be on the top of the markup. And the proper encoding, so nothing more than that, it's quite simple to bypass. And then this, when you apply this XSL to any XML, it will produce playload that you need to fit into parse control. So that was two more CVs for me and two more bugs for Microsoft. Right. So uh, I sent all of the places I could possibly find which were uh, vulnerable to this issue to Microsoft in December 2019. 
and they accepted all of them and then made five CVs and published them in April 2020. And security fix they did come up with, it looked like that. So they introduced an additional check, markup check uh, before the string is feeded to parse control. So if uh, this uh, markup that we're feeding, it will fail this uh, markup control check, uh, then the flag will be false and we will not be able to cause uh, compilation in parse control. We will, will not be able to bypass the parser filter in this case. And it seems pretty solid and it seemed pretty solid to me. So I also did submit a talk to a first virtual meeting of HailSec and I was pretty happy. But then just a few days before this uh, uh, request for content uh, was uh, about to close, I got an email from Microsoft and the email said that, well, uh, we will introduce some additional fixes for the issues in March. Well, uh, at that point, I understand that probably they did not fix everything correctly. So this fix seems, well, quite solid to me. I understand that I had to double check it and probably take a closer look. And uh, at that point in time, I got an idea that if we, uh, if you remember in the first slides, we discussed the trusted and untrusted pages. So if we will manage to execute this code somehow in the context of trusted page, which is uh, quite possible to do in my opinion, I did not try, but I think it would be possible to execute this code in the context of trusted page if you, provided some malicious web part or something, something that you can control. It will not, it will not matter if you have this flag set to false or true because trusted pages, they will allow compilation anyway. And I was of course pleased with myself and was ready to check this idea, but I did not start working on it immediately because I wanted to wait for the fixes that they will release because somewhere deep inside, I understand that they probably will fix this issue in May. Yeah, and so they did. Uh, in May, they released uh, another security patch, which contained more solid fix for that. And that fix utilized some methods that I also did not know before. It's called, it's not a method in case of, uh, in sense of .NET, it's a property of page parser class, and it's uh, called old from parse control. So now whenever SharePoint uh, parser filter will will detect that it's now being executed in the context of parse control method, it will basically deny all the compilations and all the unsafe controls on the pages. So I think that's the end game in here, at least for SharePoint. But I hope that will be useful for you if you are doing like a similar things, bug hunting for ISP.NET applications, or if you are doing security audit, or security assessment of web applications, I think that information will be useful for you. And you can look for this parse control method and unsafe all of it if your application is using kind of same uh, thread model as SharePoint, where you have trusted pages and trusted pages mitigated by partial filter. If not, you can try to cause a compilation, which probably developer does not expect using ASP.NET directive. If you can control the whole stream. Okay, uh, that's it. Uh, that's uh, all I had to say about that uh, exploit so far. And um, uh, I, I'm sorry for network <laughs> issues. I hope you could get most of what I tried to say, but let's do just a quick recap on uh, what I was trying to tell you in the session. So uh, the parse control method, unlike uh, MSDN says it can cause this compilation and it can also cause the code execution uh, using ASP.NET directives, as I explained. Uh, it can also cause uh, uh, compilation and execution via unsafe controls. So if you allow user to parse some uh, something, uh, some strings into controls using this method, you should be, be aware of unsafe controls and don't allow to parse every controls. Uh, try to implement or look for proper sanitization checks. And uh, if you try to bypass some 
uh, some mitigations and code uh, look out for the differences and how XML is parsed and how ASP.NET page parsed because they are parsed differently. And obviously, uh, what I learned from that is that you have to double check everything and you cannot trust documentation, MSDN, and whatever it says, it might be just not true. So double check everything yourself and only code probably says you the truth. And uh, I think that's it. And that will be my last question slide. And if you don't want to ask question now, you can follow me on Twitter and you can DM me your questions. And I'll be happy to get in touch regarding the security of SharePoint or web applications or whatever. Yeah, but thank, thank you. you very much, Ivan. Uh, we have a few questions for you. Yes. So uh, the first question is about your introduction and uh, how does a non hacker get CV attribution? Asking for a friend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I think, uh, like, in my opinion, I can't consider myself a hacker because, uh, in my opinion, hacker is a much more skilled person than me and my skills. I really moderate, <laughs> that's to say, I, well, you, you probably saw in this presentation, like my reversion is in .NET and, well, I guess I just cannot get to a high title of a hacker that I have in my head, so <laughs> that's why. Well, well, maybe the, the uh, level is too high for you because- Yeah, we've... maybe I said too you high are, level yeah. for myself. Yeah. <clears throat> but, uh, uh, so, how long it took to get uh, from an idea to pop popping the calculation calculator? Yeah, I think uh, it took uh, maybe a few, if we consider a few uh, full days of work, it maybe take just a few of them. Uh, because I was really lucky to find like this entry point which did work out really fast. So. Uh, Usually, the most time I spend is just to find like a good entry points. But as soon as you find one, you just have to figure out a bit how to fit your payload properly to that uh, entry point. And uh, in case of .NET and SharePoint, I think it's not that hard because you can debug it, you can decompile it, and uh, I think the overall process uh, take like a few days. And uh, uh, but uh, because I don't do it at work time, I do it like at evenings, it probably like time-wise was a, a week or something. All right. So uh, last question, uh, <clears throat> do you have a longer relationship with SharePoint previous versions as well, or are you coming uh, to this fresh with ASP.NET developer background and security, minded, uh, security mindset? Yeah, I do have a long <laughs> relationship with SharePoint. I started, uh, working with SharePoint, I think, uh, in 2007, at least the first version I was working with SharePoint was SharePoint 2007, and uh, it was a really big part of my professional career, and uh, from there I learned a lot about like and ASP.NET programming and uh, all the other stuff I do at my work time. So yeah, that was a bigger part. Uh, it's changing, it has changed uh, just a few years ago that it's not longer that big part of my job because now I'm doing more like a public cloud things. Yeah, all right. Well, thank you very much, Ivan, and uh, thank you for uh, giving the presentation. Uh, next, you. we will have Arimo and he will talk about the private call. So, a uh, few minutes. Thanks, you guys. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs>